Having been deported from Kazakhstan a few years ago, Brazil versus Argentina has got me looking over my shoulder and hoping we don't get interrupted too soon. I sympathise with the Argentinian players, but maybe not Martinez. Welcome to the Anglo-Italian pod, and as always, my name is Rory, and I'm joined by... Tommy, and you can find us on Instagram at AngloItalianPod and on Twitter at ItalianAngloPod, but we're not alone. Rory, we've got a sponsor starting from this season. Do you want to tell our listeners about it? We do. For any new listeners and for old listeners... Just we can get through this, don't worry. We are sponsored by at Sports Club Maps. You can find them on Instagram and Twitter, sportsclubmaps.co.uk. Tommy, what do they do? Who are they? They make super cool sport clubs maps. So basically, you can find a map of your favorite country printed on a mug, printed on a poster, printed on a mouse pad, with all the names of the most important clubs in that country. But Rory, is it only football or is it any sport? Good question. It is every sport. (laughs) They do American football, baseball, horse racing, um... I don't know, snooker, you name it, they've got it. And you can also get diaries. Honestly, guys, this stuff looks fucking sick and it's definitely worth checking out. If you've got any birthdays or you're really prepared for Christmas, it could be good to get this stuff ordered and sent to your loved ones. Exactly. And it's very important that you follow them both on Instagram and Twitter because starting from this next Monday, we'll be back live on Twitch and YouTube every Monday night. We will let you know on our social media at what times exactly. But we're also going to we're going to have live games and you could cop some of the merchandising from sportclubsmaps.co.uk. So make sure you follow them because you can win some pretty cool prizes. Rory, when were you deported? What's that story about you being deported in Kazakhstan? Um, Super quickly, I worked for a school in Kazakhstan three years ago and my contract was less than legal. Um, So after around a year, I ended up in Kazakh Kazakh court, which was fun. Um, And it was, the choice was either, I think it was, 18 months in prison or deportation. So I took deportation and they kicked me out of the country. But in two years, no, wait, three years time, I can return. I was banned for the country from six years, which I think was a bit harsh. So in two years, I can and will be returning. By the way, we're going to talk more about those scenes from the Brazil-Argentinian game that was absolute madness. So today, Rory and I are slightly tired because we went to bed quite late. Do you want to tell our listeners what happened last night, Rory? Yeah, if I, like more than usual, don't finish a thought or my sentences trail off, this is the reason. We had our fantasy draft, or Fanta Calcio Asta, last night. Um, We started at what, half past nine? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and we finished at three o'clock this morning. Um, the problem was I had to set my alarm for half six this morning. So today has definitely been a struggle. For the second week in a row, I'm clutching a can of Monster. This podcast is killing me, guys. Um, <laughs> and hopefully we'll make it to the end of the episode. But my God, I'm tired. Are you satisfied with your team? Very. I'm um, Honestly, I'm I like... I felt a little bit smug as I was leaving. I was like, oh, I think because there was a few transfers that I pulled off that people were looking at me like, oh, God, that was a good move. That was a good move. So I was quite happy with myself. Um, What about you, Tommy? Happy disappointments? I know there was one player that you definitely didn't want, but you did get. Yeah. So basically, uh, (laughs) how did this bid How did these bids work? So basically, the computer randomly generates names that you can purchase, and then people start bidding on them, um, which makes it extremely difficult if you've got some players in mind because they could come up at the very end of the auction. Um, the name that I really didn't want was Andanovic, Inter's goalkeeper. I paid him $54 million out of 600 I was just raising the bid for our friend Michael because he was at 34 and I was like, that's too cheap for Inter's starting goalkeeper keeper and in the end i just kept raising i was like i'm gonna stop at 55 and then i was like 54 and mike was like fine it's yours and i was like god damn it you got but then... bit on me but also castillejo yeah this one was funny so the beer was starting to flow in my bloodstream and uh, the name castillejo came out and i was like one nobody bid on the one and i was just like that's sweet man castillejo from fiorentina and people looked at me like 
dude, that's Callejon. And I was like, oh, <laughs> God damn it. I got the, I got the Jotas, the Js mixed up, and I ended yeah. up with C Castillejo, which I definitely did not want. But whatever, so I'm pretty good. satisfied with my team. Oziman and Muriel up front, unfortunately. Muriel is out injured until early October. But the funniest thing is that uh, Rory's team name is Grealish, is better than Chiesa. And you ended up getting Chiesa as well. I did. Honestly, I think the way the draft worked this time was so much better. I thought it was so much better because it, I think it meant that the players, the good players, have been more evenly spread out. Mm -hmm. And I was very tight at the beginning. I was not spending money. I waited until the end. And Chiesa was like one of the last players to come out. But I did get him. And I was so happy with that, which I think behind Immobile, he would probably be the player that people would choose to get. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so got, I was like... You've got Bonucci, Chiesa and Quagliarella, quite an Italian team. I have, I have. Yeah, I've got a bit of a Juventus heavy team, kind of by accident. But yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with it. Should we go for our starting lineups? For yeah, go for it, go for it. So I'm looking at the moment, obviously this will be tinkered with, um, Consigli in goal, then a back three of Bonucci, Demiral, and Martinez Quarta, which I'm pretty happy with. Yeah. Um, a four-man midfield of Dumfries, Benacer, McKenney, if he can resist trying to sleep with his teammate sisters, uh, and <laughs> Darmian. Then playing the number 10 role, I have Damsgaard, which I was really happy with. I so wanted that guy. That, that was a steal, man. And then up front, I have Chiesa and Qualiarella. I was pr I'm pretty happy with that team, honestly. Yeah. So my starting lineup is Andanovic in goal, then a back four with Di Lorenzo, Rodrigo Becao from Udinese, Crescito from Genoa, and Isai from Lazio. Midfield, four man, we've got Pereira, former Watford legend playing currently at Udinese, <laughs> Maggiore from Spezia, Castrovilli from Fiorentina, and Zappacosta from Atalanta. And up front, I've got Oziman for Napoli and Miranchuk for Atalanta. Oof. Of course, Muriel is currently injured. I'm going to rely a lot on him. The This is our team. And Rory, good luck to you and good luck to all of our listeners with your fantasy football deeds this season. I think we are ready to start the episode finally after blabbing about... <laughs> I think so, team. yeah. I think I'm ready to talk real football. Should we do it? Yeah, let's start with international football. So these past two weeks, uh, we've been bombarded with international football qualifications for the 2022 Qatar World Cup. We're going to start from Europe. We're going to we're going to take a close look at England and Italy, and then we're kind of going to give you an overview of the whole situation around the world. Rory, satisfied with the three lions in this international break? Yeah, I think so. I think there's been encouraging performances. Obviously, the first game was um, Andorra, which is always kind of hard to judge, really, um, because as people were quite happy to point out. Um, sorry, the first game was Hungary. Guys, there you go, listeners. First mistake. The first game was Hungary. Now, I thought that was going to be a harder game than it was. We saw in the Euros that they were like, they got great results. They got through They got through the group stage, right? Or no, they, they got eliminated, but they got some great results in that horrifically hard group. I thought it was going to be a much tougher game, but England kind of strolled to a 4-0 win. It took them a while to break through Sterling in the 55th minute, but after that, Hungary kind of collapsed. The best part about that game was seeing Sterling shut up the racists, um, Declan Rice drinking from a beer that someone threw at him. That was great to see. Some really iconic photos from that game. Um, I think that really showed the kind of the team spirit that we know is there with this England team. I feel like we talked about it before, but they're just a really likable team and they all seem to be standing up for the right things, standing up for each other. And I think this Hungary kind of performance and the celebrations really showed it. Then obviously we beat again, another 4-0, this time against um, Andorra. Messi Lingard getting two goals. Um, he, One of them, I, an absolute stunner. One of the two was beautiful, beautiful goal. Unbelievable goal. And he, like, he could be one of those players where when we look back on his career, you'd say his international career could be better than his club career. Like for England, he's always really, really good. He's always really good for England. But the big story, of course, that I'm going to talk about is that Saka, on his birthday, got two assists and a goal 
as he turned 20, getting Man of the Match award. What a way to celebrate your 20th birthday. Can you imagine? Yeah, and I love that while he was waiting to get uh, interviewed at the end of the game, the supporters were singing Happy Birthday, Bakayo. I think that was that was yeah. very nice oh. team. Man, that yeah, really, yeah. You can imagine that got me choked up a little bit. I did absolutely love it. Um, and then last night, kind of definitely the hardest game we faced was against Poland. And I think we should have really seen the game out, but I think Poland definitely deserved something from the game. It was a really feisty game. Like there was a lot of tackles, a lot of like um, angst. I think there was a bit of a halftime scuffle between Kyle Walker and Glick as Glick did this weird thing that kind of like pinched his throat. I saw some people saying it should have been a red card. It's Is it violent conduct? I don't know. It's just cheeky, I suppose. You shouldn't do it, but I don't know if you can send someone off for it. A few words and um, insults were shared across, but I think overall, a really fascinating game, really interesting game. Lewandowski was on believable now yeah, i think he tends to do that right <laughs> well this is it and it's not even in the ways that like when you think okay Lewandowski was unbelievable oh how many did he score five or six like no what, what we what we saw from Lewandowski was every other part of his game so it's his hold up play his bringing bringing other players into play his crossing his passing we saw that i think with poland he has to perform a much more like rounded kind of role he has to kind of do a bit of everything and be that focal point up front whereas by munich he can kind of focus on just being the goal scorer right and i think he was just incredible against england and he is for me the greatest striker on the planet at the moment um and i think he really showed it the goal for poland was beautiful but not quite as beautiful as harry kane's absolute belter um in the 70th minute really long range kind of dipping into the corner really beautiful goal i think kane for england is again another player where his scoring record is ridiculous and as a captain he does kind of provide these moments where he just steps up and kind of gets that goal you need or he provides that moment i think it was a really really important goal look england should have been able to see it out but what i think the deciding kind of factor was and it's a kind of trend we're noticing with southgate a little bit he didn't make any substitutions <laughs> And I think this is the trend that it feels like for Southgate, right? For like, there are so many reasons why you would make a substitution one to try and affect the game, right? But also, midway through a season, if I was a manager for one of these players, like a club manager, I'd be going, Gareth, are you trying to injure our players? Like, I know you've got a competitive game to win, but you've got a bench full of promising players here. Why are you insisting mm-hmm. that these players play 90 minutes? I just think it's really kind of irresponsible and terrible management. We've seen that Southgate maybe isn't able to affect games from the bench, and maybe this is something that's kind of continuing. I don't know. What do you think? I, why would you not make any substitution? Well, that, and we've we've thoroughly covered it during the Euros. England have a star-studded team. They have mm-hmm. two starting teams, pretty much. You could play England versus England, and it would be an incredible match. I do not understand what's the logic behind it. And as we will cover when we talk about Italy's deeds during this qualification round, um, it comes to a point when even if you thoroughly believe in the team that you're fielding, you got to shuffle up the cards, man. you got to mm-hmm. give an opportunity to the other players in the bench. And once they find their confidence, and we, as we will see with what happened with Italy, I think at that point, you really you can, you can play your cards in a better way. We will have to interview Gareth Southgate at some point, I think, Rory. You're pretty if good you're at listening, gliding. Gareth, yeah, if yeah, you're yeah. listening, then <laughs> drop us a line. But I feel like it's just if the maybe he just thought they'd see it out at one 0 but I don't know why you wouldn't just bring on another defender or bring on he loves a defensive midfielder, bring on a defensive midfielder, shore up the defense, just something for fresh legs to try and give that bit of impetus. Because England obviously started to fade and Poland started to rise, and then they get the equalizer. But to give some props to Gareth Southgate's management, I was just looking at England's recent results and the last loss came on November 15th, 2020 against Belgium. There hasn't been a defeat for England since then, except, of course, the European Championship final. First mention, first mention. There we go. First First mention mention, of the episode. Good. 
Well, that was a draw in the ninety in the in the ninety minutes, of course, one hundred and twenty minutes, and then it ended up being a loss. But so England still have to play four more games. They're going to be playing in October against Andorra and against Hungary, and then in November against Albania and against San Marino. England are currently topping their group with sixteen points over six games. Five wins and one draw. Albania are trailing. They're in second position with 12 mm -hmm. points over six games. Third is Poland with 11 points and then Hungary with 10. So it's not quite done. The mission is not quite over. But England should be making it to the World Cup quite comfortably. Agreed, Rory? Touch wood. Yes, I he think so. Is. I think looking at the fixtures we have left... I think Poland away was probably the kind of trickiest game that we had. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we've come out of it. So I think, yeah, we should really be preparing for <laughs> Qatar 2022 now. Um, but it's interesting to see who can finish second, because if Albania beat Poland to it, then bloody hell. Like, we know that Albania have got a few young, promising, exciting players, a bit of a kind of generation coming through. So I think, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who, who gets that playoff spot. And in case you're wondering about the rules, which teams are going to make it to the World Cup, well, Europe is going to bring to the World Cup 13 national teams. So there are 55 total European national teams. They were subdivided in 10 groups, and the winners of each group are going to go directly to the World Cup. All the second classified of each group, they are going to be put in more groups and they're going to play a playoff where three teams are going to punch a ticket to Qatar 2022. Did that make sense, Rory? I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it makes perfect sense. Just wait until we get to South America, where oh, 4.5 teams are going to qualify. <laughs> so it means that a team is just going with half their players. No, it doesn't mean that we're going to cover that later. Rory, did you just hit your funny bone? Is that I just what hit my funny bone on the bookshelf. Sorry, oh, if you I, heard I any I, weird noises, that's all that was. Oh. I thought I had said something extremely funny oh. and you were laughing at that. Oh, that but uh, That'll be the day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's move to Italy. Italy last night defeated Lithuania 5-0. But before that, they drew to Switzerland 0-0 and to Bulgaria 1-1. And people started thinking, you know, man, like it's all beautiful. Well, the big news, the big headline is that Italy have now the longest undefeated streak in international football ever. Thank you very much. I will accept that. We have overtaken Spain and we have overtaken Brazil. Now we are 37 games unbeaten. So that was the headline. But at the same time, people are just like, man, really? 1-1 one, one to Bulgaria? Really? Nil-nil to Switzerland? Really? Jorginho doing that fucking skip <laughs> once again? Dude, and I thoroughly right, said it yeah. in last year's pod. You can go, Rory. Yeah, go for it. it one, he's not going to change his style. That's not going to happen. He's going to continue to do that. The problem is goalkeepers are starting to turn onto it. And Jan Sommer is a bloody good goalkeeper. So I think he was asking for that. When he stepped up, I was like, Sommer's going to save this. Oh, look, yeah. Sommer saved it. <laughs> like, he's a great keeper, by the way. I can't believe the bigger clubs aren't coming in for him. The guy's unbelievable. Oh, anyway. He's been super consistent over the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the... I think he was the first keeper that was wearing um, those new look gloves, you know, the ones that look absolutely super smooth all over. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It was the first time that I saw it like a few years back, and I was like, that's sick. But um, um, let's go back to the first game. We drew 1 1 to Bulgaria. The first goal was by Rory's very own Federico Chiesa, and that was a hey. beauty of a goal. He left two defenders sitting on their feet, dribbled past the two more gave a little ball to Immobile, who just had to touch it. And then he did all the rest, and he scored the 1-0. But then Iliev tied the game at the 14th minute, and Italy were not able to overturn the score. Spoiler alert, Immobile didn't do shit. In the second game versus <laughs> Switzerland, Mancini fielded the exact same 
team, but then, as we said, Jorginho missed the penalty. Berardi missed an open oh, chance all that alone. That ball for him. I can't remember who put the ball through, but that was a hell of a pass. I want to really say, done I wanna say it was Bonucci, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, he should have scored there. And then people were just like, all right, man. All right. The record is all beautiful and everything. But what the fuck are we doing with Immobile up top? And finally... After drawing, because that was the thing, Italy had won uh, in um, over 90 minutes against Belgium uh, in the European Championship. But after then, we drew 1-1 mm -hmm. to Spain and won on penalties. We drew 1-1 to England and won on penalties. And then we drew 1-1 to Bulgaria and 0-0 to Switzerland. So people were just like, right, man, so are we the European champions or what? Where, where is our drive to actually qualify? Because then the, our qualification could be put on the line as well. So then Mancini decided to shuffle the cards, fielded a completely different 11 with Acerbi and Bastoni at center backs, Biraghi and Di Lorenzo as the wing backs, and then Pessina, Giorginio, and Cristante in midfield, and Bernardeschi, Raspadori, and Moise Keane. Good to have him back. So Up good front. to have him back. Man, and when I saw him score right away, he scored at the 11th minute. I was mm. like, why didn't he call him up for the European Championship? I mean, it went the way it went, and we're all happy with the final result. But yeah, how many yeah. times... Don't complain too much, eh? Yeah, yeah, how yeah. many times did we wonder, what the fuck is Immobile doing? Like, and he I mean... feel like he, he put all his eggs in the Immobile basket. Like, I liked I liked Bellotti, and I, I said before the tournament, I think Bellotti could, Bellotti could be like a good alternative. But yeah, to not have that kind of wild card, which I think Moise Kane kind of is... It did seem a bit weird. But look, if he's going to get more chances, you have to say it's only Lithuania. And look, like Lithuania, I don't want to be disrespectful, but they're not a particularly strong football team. Mm -hmm. But it's good to see that Mancini's giving these players chances. Um, and look, you, you can't do much more to kind of put a claim on that place than score two goals the second he throws you in, eh? Yeah, 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 yeah. Two goals in 30 minutes. That was absolutely the way to introduce yourself to your audience after a long break. Mm -hmm. But it was beautiful to see also Raspadori, very exciting Italian oh. talent. He started another Sassuolo on. one, right? Another yeah. Sassuolo one. And they were playing, they were playing in Reggio Emilia last night. So he was in front of his home crowd. Beautiful to see him punching the goal in as well. And then the goals that followed were an own goal by Ukus and a cross that kind of went in <laughs> by Di Lorenzo. But guess what? He's in my fantasy football team, so I'm all Boom. about that. <laughs> so now Italy are top of their group with 14 points and six games played. But beware, because Switzerland have only played four games and they're on eight points. So in October, Italy are going to play in the Nations League. And while Italy play in the Nations League, Switzerland are going to take on both Ireland and Lithuania. Were they to win both games, they would go on even points with Italy. Luckily, in November, we will have the final showdown, Italy versus Switzerland and Northern Ireland versus Italy. If Italy make a positive result in both games, we should comfortably be punching the ticket for Qatar 2022. Um, hopefully, Switzerland don't win both games because we know that sometimes Italy don't do very well with pressure. But that, <laughs> that was it for Italy and England. Rory, do you want to take us through the remaining groups of the uh, European qualifiers for Qatar 2022? Well, let's quickly go through it. So I'm going to go through who's top, and then I'm going to focus on one of the groups, which I think is quite or one of the more interesting groups. But we have, firstly, this is good. Okay, so we have Group A. Is Portugal are currently top with 13 points, followed closely by Serbia on 11, and Ireland all the way down in fourth on two points. Now, I'm going to quickly go through Ireland. Ireland, Serbia... Ireland, again, played really bloody well and definitely should have got a win. It just didn't happen. But the good thing that's happening here is that the papers in Ireland are trying to chase Stephen Kenny out of the job, but the fans aren't letting it happen. They were singing his name after the game. I know that I personally, and I've talked to a lot of people on Twitter who are also really enjoying this brand of football. So, look, Ireland will not be at the next World Cup but maybe we can make the next championship, the European Championships. That is what this project is for. When this, this group stage is just about implementing the system. Let's focus on the next tournament. 
And you know what's beautiful about our podcast? One of the beautiful things about our podcast is that our episodes actually don't have an expiry, day, expiry date, which means that if you want, you can go back to the previous episode, go to the 50th minute, I believe. You can find the timing on the episode description and listen to the interview that we had with Irish legend Eamon Zayed. And we also talk about Kinney and uh, his managerial job at Ireland. And Eamon just seems to be one of the many reasonable people that says, don't focus on the results right now. Just trust the process. He's doing a good job. It takes some time. We're a small nation, but there is a lot of exciting talent, and Ken is doing the right job to bring it up. Well, this is it, exactly. And the exciting talent, Gavin Bazunu in goal. He is Man City's, I don't know, fifth choice goalkeeper, but he's currently on loan at Portsmouth. This kid is unbelievable. I think he's 19, 20 years old. He is a genuinely great goalkeeper. I think he's got a great future in the game. He's great to see. And I hope I say this right, Omo Bamidele, the centre-back, another 19-year-old, was outstanding again against Serbia. So I think some really exciting players there for Ireland. But in Group B, we have Spain top on 13, Sweden second on nine points. That group looks kind of sewn up, really. We've done Group C, that's Italy. Group D, now this group is fascinating so we have france top on 12 points then second ukraine on five third finland on five fourth bosnia on three and fifth kazakhstan on three so all four teams are separated by two points so the playoff spot is really really up for grabs kazakhstan have been Honestly, a bit of a revelation. They're still yet to win a game, but they are getting points off everybody. They're getting draws. They drew against Bosnia. They drew against Ukraine. They unfortunately lost to Finland, but were actually quite unlucky in that game. And this group, I think, is really worth keeping an eye on. Look, none of it's a bit of a hipster's choice. None of the nations that you'd usually sit and watch. But I think this group, in terms of how exciting a qualification process can be, this one's actually pretty bloody exciting. Um, I think anyone could get it. Ukraine are kind of flattering to deceive at the moment i think yeah but it's uh, it's very interesting as you said because also then all these playoffs all these second teams they're gonna have another chance and the three Mm -hmm. of them are gonna be punching a ticket to qatar 2022 moving on to the next group group e belgium are leading with 16 points and doing quick quick math it means that they have already qualified officially for the world cup and a certain romelu lukaku celebrated his 100th appearance for belgium scoring oh man i don't remember the stat right now 54 i think it is yeah 54 goals yeah in 100 games the guy is a machine belgium are followed by czechia uh the czech republic they changed their name overnight um (laughs) with two points sorry uh, they're second with seven points and wales are third on seven as well and then fourth and fifth belarus belarus what do you call it in belarus Belarus, Belarus, sorry belarus and estonia group f it's topped by denmark on 18 points yes ladies and gentlemen they have won all of their fixtures (laughs) they have scored 22 goals and they have conceded zero so Oof. the Danes are set to go to Qatar 2022 Scotland are second on 11 points and Israel are third on 10 now wouldn't it be something if Israel qualified for the World Cup well they've in got Qatar? <laughs> they've got a bit of a squad coming together like Zahavi is unbelievable he's getting goals for them every bloody game but the the big headline this time was Scotland winning in Vienna that is a massive result for Scotland fair play like I think Wales haven't been to a tour to a World Cup since 1950, and I think Scotland it might be a little bit shorter. <laughs> Maybe 98 was the last time they were at a World Cup, so it'd be fantastic for either of those teams to make their way there. But yeah, Israel would be an interesting one if I don't know if Iran and Israel get drawn in the same group. Is that possible if they both qualify? <laughs> that could be an interesting one. <laughs> Oh my God! I don't. I don't want to think. I don't want to think about that right now. But the next group is Group G with the Netherlands leading at 13 points, but they are on even points with 
Holland, Norway, and I hope that you did see that goal from Holland on their training session. Man, I just watched it on loop. It was incredible. That, oh, just, yeah, I watched it like 10 times or something. Just the noise, the noise when he hits that ball is terrifying. I actually have mad respect for the goalkeeper who even tried to save it by raising <laughs> yeah. his arm. Hey, Kordats, who is currently, I always bring up this little story because I think it's very funny. Kordats, who is currently Inter's second goalkeeper, um, he used to play at Crotone for a very long time, mm. but he was actually in Inter's youth team in the early 2000s, and one day Recoba wanted to practice his free kicks and he was just like, hey you, you want to be my keeper while I do some, some free kicks? And the 17-year-old Cordats was just like, yeah, why not? Well, what happened? Recoba ended up breaking his wrist. <laughs> he had to sit out of a football pitch for one year and a half, and when he came back he had to do, you know, restart from yeah. the... <laughs> <laughs> restart slowly but yeah when i saw that i was just like that's how you break a hand when holland scores that sort of dagger from two meters so definitely worth keeping an eye on group g because turkey are third on 11 points so it's all but secured for the netherlands and or norway group and, H. Sorry, and sorry. turkey got absolutely slapped by holland 6-1 as well so they are not in good shape all these, honestly, I feel quite good that I wasn't the only person to put them as a dark horse, but everyone who said they were a dark horse at the Euros is getting proven wrong in a massive way at the moment because they're an absolute shambles. Yeah, absolutely. But they have the players. I don't really get it. We should interview our friend Semi from uh, Turkey once mm -hmm. again to kind of understand what's going on with the national team because once when you see when you read the names, you're like, they should be doing they way be better doing than they are. Yeah, yeah. But the next group is Group I. We've already covered it because, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Group H, Croatia topping it at 13 points, but they're on even points with Russia, who are second, followed by Slovakia at nine, Slovenia at seven, Malta and Cyprus at four. Group I is England's group, and Group J is currently topped by Germany at 15 points. And hey, talk about an underdog. Armenia second at 11 points, followed by Romania in third position at 10. Now, wouldn't it be something to see Armenia at Qatar 2022? I, th I, f I feel like with it being so random that Qatar, that Qatar have the World Cup or so like mismatched, let's say, that Qatar have the World Cup, it would be great to see some like kind of mismatched teams in there. Let's get an Armenia in there. Let's get a few countries that have never been before. I think it'd be quite good, right? A bit, a bit of freshness. Um, the interesting thing is that they haven't won in a very long time, Armenia, and they still managed to be on 11 points. They lost 6-0 to Germany, drew 0-0 with Macedonia, and drew 1-1 with Liechtenstein, but they still find themselves with a massive chance of qualifying and ahead of Romania. So, yeah, it would be great to see them there, Mkhitaryan leading his nation into the World Cup. I think we'd all like to see that. Yeah, definitely. But let's move away from the old continent and let's cross the Atlantic, headed slightly towards south. So we're going to cross the equator and we're going to go to South America now. Listen to this. I think this is incredible. Think about the size of Europe, 55 national teams. <laughs> think about the size of South America, 10 national teams. And guess what? They are all in the same qualifying group. I would hate it if I was from South America because out of these 10 teams which, spoiler alert, are pretty damn good, only four and a half are going to make it to the World Cup. What does it mean four and a half? It means that four will make it directly, while the fifth one is going to play an intercontinental uh, what do we call it? Play the playoff off. with yeah. the winner from Asia? I think it's the Asian... I, so yeah. I have the rules in front of me now. So it's uh, five national teams from Africa, 4.5 from South America and 4.5 from Asia, 3.5 from Central America and 0 0.5 from Oceania. So oh, I gosh. think that I think that these So New Zealand basically New Zealand, yeah. New Zealand or Australia. So these four these uh, these four continents they're going to play these intercontinental playoffs. Currently, in South America, Brazil are first. They have won all of their seven games. They're first on 21 points, followed by Argentina on 15. Ecuador are third on 13. Uruguay, fourth on 12. And Colombia are currently sitting fifth at 10. Now, before we talk about the madness of the Brazil-Argentina game, 
I have a soft spot for a country in South America, which everybody in South America fucking hates. Um, I was traveling in Peru and I just heard so many people talking shit about Chile that I was just like, mm. I have yeah, a feeling. Yeah, they don't like Chile, do they? They really don't like, like Chile. I have a feeling that once I cross the border, I'm going to fall in love with Chile. <laughs> Guess what? I kind of did. Uh, so there is a lot of history of why other South American <laughs> countries hate them. Yeah, Guess Google, what? Like, we're, we're not going to go into it. Google no, we're not going to yeah. go. We're not going to go into it. But one of them is also because of the folk, the war in the Falkland Islands, because Chile backed uh, England. <laughs> and it was, just like, last. <laughs> it was just like, what the fuck? But Chile, man, they are only on seven points after eight games. It's looking quite impossible to qualify. They still have many games to play one two three four five six seven eight nine games to play so everything is possible but i'm calling on you arturo vidal i'm calling on you alexis sanchez i'm calling on you buddies eric pulgar please try to win the next games because i do want to see your national team at the world cup but now let's think about playing an international game for fifa you're all ready to take on maybe your bitterest rivals in history and as the game kicks off the police just storm the pitch the health authorities of brazil storm the pitch and they go hunting down four players one of which rory can't stand now i'm this was all because they were not respecting the quarantine coming from england but i mean that's what messi said right we've been here for four days you stormed the pitch to take us off didn't that look like a political sort of like show oh, off mate, it's the way? most it's the most is conquer calf right it's the most conquer calf thing in the world like it's brazil fucking loved this the opportunity to kind of like humiliate their biggest rivals and like then to put on a training match afterwards and be like okay we'll just like flex in front of the cameras and like piss about i think it was like a huge political move a huge like pr move and look like there's been a lot of players there's been a lot of fans in england get angry with the fact that the players traveled and i can definitely understand that um their clubs have asked them not to and you know it's kind of health warnings and health risks and stuff so i can understand why people would be angry but yeah the the authorities really should have done it upon arrival like the the whole thing was just like theater and i don't know if you've seen that picture of messi and neymar as they're both looking down and trying not to laugh it's like they both know how much of a shambles their like continental f- football governing body is if you know i mean the whole thing is theater i thought it was ridiculous but the training match was really great to watch i'll be honest <laughs> <was> great viewing <laughs> No, I think the, the the thing that just looks intimidating to me, so when I saw the footage of what happened, we all know the history of South America, and we know that there have been multiple coups over the, <laughs> over the years. And yeah. I mean, when I saw, and the, look, the Brazilian police, I've been to Brazil, and the pr- Brazilian police don't fuck around. They look absolutely intimidating. Like the normal policeman that you find on the street, he's dressed like a SWAT soldier, pretty much. And the, seeing that footage of the police storming the pitch, Man, for a second, I was like, that looks just scary. It looks Mm. overly intimidating and scary. And also the way they did it, they were like literally chasing down the players. They had a list of names and they were like, get that one, that one, and that one. When it could all be done, like sitting down at the table and explaining the rules. But then you also have to say that um, Buendia and Martinez, I think, lied on their paperwork and said that their Premier League game was played in Eastern Europe so that they wouldn't like... They've also falsified documents and been incredibly stupid. Like, So I think, yeah, the authorities could have done it at a better time. Time, but the players have also set themselves up for this situation quite heavily. And now the whole thing has turned into a political power play because now the Brazil, wait, FIFA have banned the players from playing this weekend, I think, or banned them for five days. Some players are going to miss the Champions League on Tuesday. I think it's a huge power play between like the big leagues now and FIFA since this Super League idea came. I think it's all getting a bit um, dick swinging contest. I don't know. So I was uh, a yeah, dick swinging contest. I like that. Um, I was reading uh, um, because I I got Pulgar at the fantasy football auction mm-hmm. that last night, and Pulgar plays for Chile, and he was playing in the qualifying rounds in South America. So I was wondering, is he going to be playing this uh, Sunday? And I was reading an article about the fact that multiple Italian and English clubs they all like came together and they pretty much collected money. They they pulled money 
to to pretty much rent private planes to fly these people right, right, back right. to Europe. So that's kind of insane how South America are coping with the coronavirus situation. I mean, I understand that it's very important to do it, but we, I mean, I never saw the police storming the pitch in any game in Europe. No, um, <laughs> no, no, thankfully no. Thankfully so there, no. Is, there is a way to do it. So guys, we are still going to cover very quickly Africa. If you want to take a look at the Asian groups, they are pretty interesting. My favorite one is Iran, Iraq, Bahrain, Hong Kong, and Cambodia. So there, there are some pretty fun names but rory five teams are going to qualify from africa how's it looking down there it is looking pretty bloody interesting the team at the moment that i'm quite excited for is libya now they are in group f they are with egypt gabon and angola now egypt we know are like an african powerhouse won the afcon so many times usually at the world cup right if any african team qualifies it's usually them they are second behind Libya on four points. Uh, Egypt are on four points, Libya are on six points. Only two games played, but Libya looking quite um, looking like quite a threat. They beat Aubameyang's Gabon 2-1. Aubameyang had a goal disallowed that definitely shouldn't have been disallowed, but nevertheless, they got the three points, and they then beat Angola 1-0. So for Libya, it could be quite exciting. Elsewhere, we have at the top, we have... Um, oh, Algeria are top of their group. We have Tunisia, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Mali, South Africa could be a return of the Bafana Bafana, um, Senegal top, and Guinea Bissau, and finally Tanzania. So there's some exciting teams that could be making their first appearance. As always, I will be keeping an eye across Africa. And especially at the AFCON this January, me and Tommy are trying to think about how we're going to cover it on the pod, but we will be covering the AFCON as well. Definitely. Absolutely. The Africa Cup of Nations, also known as one of Rory's favorite tournaments in the world. And I love it. Absolute chaos every time. Absolute chaos. And I feel like we need to give a shout out to our American friends in the United States. Guys, wake the fuck up. Come on. El Salvador, United States, nil-nil. United States, Canada, 1-1. Honduras, United States, 1-4. That's more like it. I have to say, one of my favorite things, I follow a few um, American Twitter accounts, like American soccer Twitter accounts, and it's always so great. After the USA have played, I'll wake up, check Twitter in the morning, and it's just Americans losing their shit at how annoyed uh, how annoyed they are about the team, and it's really entertaining to watch. Yeah, by all accounts, they've been a bit underwhelming, but at least you know America should be walking that qualification. Like a lot of the teams there, really aren't much competition, really, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Agreed, agreed. It's a weird, uh, it's a weird um, conference to say the mm-hmm. least, um, but not weirder than Iraq, Iran, and Hong Kong in the same group. Yeah, I think. They, yeah. honestly, it, even like Kazakhstan being in Europe, but then Kyrgyzstan on, and yeah, Uzbekistan no. are, but then Tajikistan on, and you're like, wait, where's this line? I don't know. It all gets a bit confusing around there. I get why. <laughs> Israel are, are under UEFA, though. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's definitely a good show. That's probably a good show. That does make sense. Um, <laughs> Rory, we're almost done with our Euro review. Um, we are going to, pull, to, to talk to our friend Luca in the weekly topic about crazy Italian chairman. But first, na- um, the national leagues are back. Serie A kicks off again this weekend, and so does the Premier League. Rory, shall we start from England? Let's start from England. So we have the game that everyone's talking about, the return of Ronaldo, Manchester United versus Newcastle United on Saturday at three o'clock. Now, the problem here has been that in England, there is a blackout that you cannot show Saturday at three o'clock games on TV because they think it will affect attendances. Now, all the TV companies, Sky, have got very upset that they can't broadcast Ronaldo's return obviously lots of money to be made there and it's weirdly kicked off a debate about whether the 3 p.m blackout is out of date I personally think it is um I think so many people watch football on tv now and a stadium can only hold so many people right and the audience is so global that maybe it would be worth um showing Saturday three o'clock games but I saw a really interesting uh idea on Twitter uh, by Grace Robertson. She's a really great follow, really great follow. And she said, maybe 
for the Premier League, they should stop all Premier League games at three o'clock on Saturday, right? They all play at different times and three o'clock on a Saturday is only for the lower leagues because then this could encourage people to go and watch their local team live but watch the Premier League on TV, seeming that the stadiums are full anyway. I thought it was quite an interesting idea. Listeners, let us know if you think it's good or terrible. Um, after that, the other games that I had an eye on are... We have Leicester City versus Manchester City again um, on Saturday at 3 o'clock. And on Sunday, we have Leeds versus Liverpool. That was two great games last year. That is on Sunday at half past five. So some big games. And of course, Arsenal are officially starting their season against Norwich. We will see how (laughs) that goes. We will see how that goes. The Derby. Rory, I've got a question for you. Is Ronaldo going to score? And if so, how many is he going to bag? on his return at Old Trafford? I'm going to say, oh, Newcastle are terrible. I'm going to say he gets two. Ooh, a little brace for Ronaldo mm-hmm. on his long-awaited return at Old Trafford. We shall see. Um, the Premier League is going to wrap up on Monday night with Everton Burley, while on Sunday night, we're going to have Leeds taking on Liverpool at home moving to italy um let me open my app really quickly (laughs) i'm buying myself time okay on saturday at 3 p.m we've got empoli venezia here they meet again from serie b to serie a who is going to win they haven't been doing that great thus far uh venezia have lost both games they have conceded five goals and scored zero while empoli managed to win their game, their big game against Juventus. But guess what? Spalletti's Napoli could go eight points ahead of the Bianconeri of Max Allegri Juventus if they do beat them on Saturday. We've got at 6 p.m. We've got Napoli Juventus. Definitely an exciting one. But if that wasn't exciting enough, at, on the same evening at 8.45 p.m., we've got Atalanta Fiorentina. And man, I don't know. I have a feeling that Fiorentina are back in business. I don't think they're going to disappoint like they did in the previous three or four seasons where they were fighting relegation. They have assembled a very competitive team and I want to see them deliver. And they've got a great manager. They've got the Spezia manager, right? It seems yeah. like the, he's got a really exciting brand of football. I think it's going to be a really exciting season for Fiorentina. I picked up quite a few of their players as I think they're going to do well. So exciting times and Vlavic is just... Just Vlavic and be- beautiful to watch. Beautiful to watch. Absolutely. And then we've got on uh, Sunday, the big game, definitely the standout game, is AC Milan Lazio at 6 p.m. Both teams are undefeated. I'm super excited to see mm. Sarri's Lazio against an opponent like AC Milan in the San Siro. The fans are back. The atmosphere is going to be electric. Is on it 50% s- capacity or is it full? Uh, I think it's 50%. 50%, okay. Yeah. And then on Sunday night, we've got Roma Sassuolo. I have a feeling when I read this headline, that is going to be a goal mm-hmm. fast. So yeah. keep an eye, keep your eye on Tammy Abraham and the uh, old likes. And then the Serie A is going to wrap up on Monday night with Bologna Verona. I think that's it from the Premier League and Serie A. But Rory, are you ready? to dive onto some uh, a very fun page of Italian football history. This is a part of Italian football culture that absolutely fascinates me. I love it every time I see, even last season, the Benevento chairman going wild and accusing people of cheating. You have It just happens every year. You have these mad people that own clubs, go crazy, and now we're going to hear about some of them. And it's time for our weekly topic. So like before, where we've been joined by AFC Finners to take us through some English football history, we are now going to be joined by friend of the show. He was with us all the way back on episode 52 to talk about Italian football. And he's back. It is Luca. And he is here to take us through some fascinating people or characters in Italian football. Luca, how are you today? Ciao, guys. Thank you, thank you for the invitation again. Always good, always good. Thanks God. Uh, I hope you you are ready to know this these people. Maybe you know already, but especially for me and Tommy, we are very proud because we love this 
these people and there's no one we know that in the end doesn't love this uh, mythological creatures that we will present beautiful i think the listeners are going to be intrigued so for you listeners we're going to be talking about italy's craziest chairman slash owners slash presidents now originally me and tommy were going to be doing this as a joint english and italian episode but very quickly we realized that the italians deserve an episode of their own and maybe we will visit the english ones in the future people like ken bates vincent tan sam hamam but for now i think we'll focus on the incredible world of italian presidents yeah, I just want to say one thing very quickly. Luca, he, he he predicted on our show before the European Championship started that Italy would win the trophy. So congratulations, Luca. See, I, see, guys, but you know why? Uh, not because uh, I was so convinced, but just because in football is uh, it's like a cycle, you know. So in the end, if you if you check, it's always the same teams, that especially for the Euro Cup or the World Cup, it's always the same team. No, so it's Italy, it's Germany. Yes, yeah, sometimes you have a surprise or whatever, but in the end, it's uh, it's all I'm still <laughs> waiting for England's turn to come back round again. It's been a long yeah. time, hey, that's a big wheel. Six, but man, you years. should be, I think you should be really proud because, uh, <laughs> because uh, second place is a second place, and also because England did well. And you know, slowly after the last World Cup and this Euro Cup, I think there is hope for. Uh, for, for the immediate future, eh? I think so. I agree. I agree. I think so. There is hope. There is always a hope for the English. They're always singing that song, It's Coming Home. You're a hopeful You're a hopeful people. It's I all we've say. got, Tommy. If you see in the country, it's all we've got is hope. <laughs> That's all we've got. But one thing we have to say, they, 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 they believe it, huh? Because uh, I don't think that other countries would continue, you know, to... Believe and believe and believe. I think after after so many years, many <laughs> many, many people. Yeah, of course, many people would have said, "Okay, that's it, enough for us." Uh, so this we have to recognize <laughs> to give credit to this. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll take that as a compliment. I think that's a compliment. I'll take it as a compliment. I just had to mention this because it was a pretty big shout before the tournament started. Luca called it. But going back to our weekly topic, as Rory said, today we're going to talk about crazy Italian chairman. Now, Luca, we were talking about earlier, like, what is the big difference between chairman in Italy and in England? And back in the day, especially in Italy, there was a sort of overlapping of roles within the club. And many times the owners of the club, meaning the people who would put the money, inject the money into the club, they were entrepreneurs who also acted as the club's president. Um, of course, the big example, the first big example was the Agnelli family that was the head of Juventus. They were the owners of Fiat. And then the Moratti family, they owned the biggest, they still own the biggest oil refinery. Uh, I think it's called that uh, in um, in Italy, petrol refinery. What do you call it, Rory? Uh, refinery, not to be a teacher about it, but refinery. <laughs> refinery. Yeah, yeah. And they purchased the Inter Milan. So these were, were big entrepreneurs that purchased teams. And today, we're going to talk about some smaller entrepreneurs that, however, made history in Italy and in top flight Italian football. Luca, I let you start. What are the three names that we picked? You can start from wherever you want. We're always talking about the 1990s, early 2000s. See, see true. before uh, revealing the names, uh, we just... Mm, we just have to start with this thing. So the, in, in Italy, the owner is called the Presidente. Okay. So uh, what is a Presidente in Italy and why it's so important? So why we are here to talk about uh, about them? As Tommy said, remember that um, in those years, they were first uh, businessmen with, uh, with a lot of success. And then they, maybe because they had passion for football, mainly because they saw that in football you can earn and, uh, and use more money in a different way, they also decided to buy, uh, to buy a team. That in many cases, we will see they, they were supporters of this team. But uh, why is so important in Italy this uh, role of Presidente? Because Presidente, we have it everywhere, in, in every country, every football team as a, as a owner. But sometimes it's a group, sometimes it's not. Well, Presidente, you know, is uh, the, the president of the football club is, is the, the main figure. 
typically, you know, he, he uses numerous collaborators both for technical area and, and for the manager for the managerial area. But in this case, uh, you have to consider these people like like a father, but not like a modern father, like an old father that decides everything. You can't say no. He, he decides everything from from who to buy to to the to the formation to to the lineup of the of the team. So and it was uh, a bit more dictatorial than presidential. For sure, right? that that's exactly what they were in a in a very you know uh, democratic way. <laughs> because in a but but in a very show off way, but for sure uh, they were deciding. And everything. also, and also when there were when there were refereeing scandals or there was a game that went particularly bad for the team, they would be the ones to show up uh, at the post game press conference. Because at that point they were just like, there is nothing that the manager can say, there is nothing that the players can say. I am the father of this family. I am the owner. I'm going to talk to the journalists. And this already tells you a little bit of these type of characters. What Luca said about the father, I think it's very Italian, like this old school father who runs the family. And when there is a problem, he's the one in charge to the point that many times the managers would listen to them to for the starting 11. Now, I just need to quickly, because in England, that's like when chairmen have got involved in starting lineups, that's like a red flag. That's like a huge siren goes off and most managers just walk out of the job. I think Paul Scholes recently walked out of a managerial job because the chairman tried to influence who he was going to play. Why do you think that is not such a big deal in Italy? First of all, I think it's not such a big deal, or it was not such a big deal because the because of the personality of the people we are talking. So if it is Berlusconi that decides this, you know, for those who, did, who doesn't know, Berlusconi was also prime minister of Italy. So imagine saying no to such a it's not just a normal owner, you know, just to give you an ex an example that came to to my mind. And second, also because. For me, during that period, but also now, being a good manager, I don't want to say is on a second level, but being friend and being in line with the owner is even more important than being uh, a good manager. Which is, which is what Allegri and Spalletti are very good at. They just listen to what the club, the club's there, the club decides the direction, and they know that people like Allegri and Spalletti. Uh, differently from Conte, for example, they're always going to shut up and they're going to listen to what the owner says. Well, Today, that's different from deciding the lineup, right? It's okay for the owner to say, we're going to go in this direction of football or this player, not that player, but deciding the lineup and tactics is like a, it seems to me like an extra step. Just you, just you wait until we talk about these characters. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luca, but, I let, I let you reveal the first name. Yeah, the one last thing, uh, another important uh, topic to know is the family business, because Italy is the queen of family business, you know, but family business from the medieval times that they still do the same thing. And this is very important because, you know, in a country like this, historically, we never had many foreign investors in Italy. It is only in the last years that some tried to operate in Italy, many of them with no success. And some of them, like, for example, Zang family in Italy, even if they had success, even if they won, I can guarantee you they are still seen as not competent or not completely clear. There is always this, you know, nostalgic element that people prefer uh, someone present, someone there every time, someone that when you have to, when you have someone to protect you, is there, you know, no matter what. And we will see that these people were the absolute boss in this, in doing this, because they were also showmen. I don't know if they were born like this or if they grew up like this or if they did some course, but they were uh, actors act, sometimes, act, you know? Acting courses for yeah. our, our <laughs> friends. All right, so, Luca, we're going to start from the city of Parma. And si. if you're a lover of Italian football in the 1990s, you will remember that Parma team. And, of course, you will remember the big sponsor on their jersey. That's where everything starts. So the sponsor was Parmalat. And the Parmalat was huge in Italy. So Parmalat was basically, it started as a dairy company, a local dairy company from the city of Parma. 
and it became a multinational. It was huge. So, Luca, you can confirm that when we were kids at the supermarket, the aisles of the supermarket we were filled with Parmalat products from your carton of milk to the snacks that kids would take to school. It was huge, and it was started by Callisto Tanzi, which is our first big name. He started this company, dropped out of college, started this company, made it become huge, and eventually he purchased Parma. And I let you go, Luca. Sí, sí, correct. Parmalat uh, it's, uh, it's a big name in the but not only in Italy, in the whole world uh, scenario of, you know, distributor of milk and, and cheese. And uh, especially in Italy, that's right, this is a nostalgic element. We were bombarded by these uh, products. Every, everything was Parmalat when you, when you used to go to the, to the supermarket with your, with your mom, you know. So the name was already, you, you could immediately associate Parma, the city, and Par, FC Parma, the team, to Parmalat, the, the, the company. So this already gives the idea of the of the of the importance and also again of the family role, you know. It's like they do this. It was clear to everyone who they are, where they come from. They are this family, and they have the and they are also the owner of that team. So you know, it, it's strong. Everything is strong in this story. Again, um, exactly. So Callisto Tanzi is uh, is the name. He was the owner, the president. So basically, it's it's interesting because, as Tommy said, he already had this this company. But the the key point is the the Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak is the is the packaging, you know, the packaging okay. of, of milk. Yeah, because this Tetra Pak was he, he discovered this Tetra. They say that he, he discovered Callisto discovered this Tetra Pak in in Sweden okay. because yeah during the travel because this was the perfect packaging to conservate milk or cheese, you know. This, uh, as a packaging, is very all-round and not expensive. So he knew that with this packaging, he could sell without, uh, without investing too much money. And he was mm -hmm. right, because uh, the distribution of, uh, again, milk and cheese was, was huge in this period. It was almost a monopoly. And also, and this is the genius, at that time, he, he used to start to do, he was using international sport champions uh, uh, in TV um, okay. for his spots. For example, we had Nicky Lauda, Nelson Piquet, mm -hmm. or Gustav, uh, Gustav Toni to do the sport. So it was, it was common to see these champions in uh, you, uh, consuming uh, his products. Uh, of course, it's a multi, multi-millionaire business and uh, basically he owned the company from 1961 to 2003 that were, we had the, the crack, the, the, the bankrupt. So what made him buy Parma? Did he sell himself as a as a Parma fan or was it just because he was from that city? And how did people feel when he bought the club? I don't believe that much this thing of the supporter, you know, like uh, the Laurentiis now, oh, I am a Napoli supporter because it's my city. That's for me is partially true in the sense that, yeah, he's from there, maybe he, he's happy if they win, but owning a, a football team, it's, a, it's like a mine of money, especially in that time. So for me, he knew that, of course, it was, it was an opportunity because Parma at that time was not a good team. It was an average team. They, were, uh, they never participated to Serie A. So again, it's an investment. He saw that he could buy. And of course, he saw he could invest his money in, uh, in football. That, remember that during the 90s, football was, uh, was very important in Italy because um, it was one of the main um, one of the main actor in, in creating money in Italy. It was not just a secondary business. But definitely, I think that for the citizens of Parma, for the supporters of Parma, as Luca was saying, there is this big tradition of trusting more people that come from your city, especially if they're owning the club and stuff. So I think that there was this was in 1996. So unfortunately, I was only four years old. I do not remember the headlines on the newspapers and all that. But I, I can only imagine that for the city of Parma, it must have been like, holy shit, like one of the biggest companies in Italy is making a statement, is purchasing this team that has never competed in top flight Italian football. And what could be the final objective if not making a statement in Serie A? And that's what they did, because this is a team where Calisto Tanzi was president. Actually, this is a very another very Italian thing. The president of Parma was his son, Stefano, but he was the one who was putting the money in the team. 
and they eventually won. I mean, they assembled that Parma team, and we can just you know come up with names by mem by heart. I think uh, the Buffon, Turam, Veron, uh, Carespo, all these players. Uh, they were part of a team that ended up winning the the UEFA Cup, which is the current day Europa League, but back when it was extremely, extremely competitive. So he really succeeded in making Parma a household name of Italian football. But then, Luca, what happened? See, this is the the sad part of this, uh, of this story, but it's not that sad. I think it's just normal life. You know, when you, uh, you cannot pretend to be only successful, you need to also be able to face failure uh, because failure is normal in life and especially in in business so yeah exactly after all those years because let's let's just remember our listeners that parma won two uefa cup they won one european super cup three coppa italia and one uh, coppa delle Coppe, which is really a lot especially if you consider it at that in that period the the names of the other teams with inter with milan with juve roma Lazio at a very high level. So Parma to be a provincial seat in the end, it was it was really successful, and it is one of the most successful uh, Italian team at an international level in mm -hmm. uh, the last years. This this we always have to to remember. And as as um, as Tommy said, the, the names of the players that played there are, are amazing. You know, we had Buffon, Turam, Cannavaro, Dino Baggio, Crespo, Chiesa, Enrico, the father, mm -hmm. uh, Veron. So, you know, it's, uh, it's really, it was, I think they never, they were also close to win the Scudetto, but they never managed because at that time all the other teams were, were absolutely fantastic. But as Tommy said, you know, there, there, there is an end. Because, yeah, the, basically, just to, to say it quickly, police will discover a hole of 14 billion <laughs> of debt. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, this was we, something that was common in Serie A at the time, and it's like kind of, we call it creative accounting, right? And it's like where you're... <laughs> it was common, yeah, it's very yeah, right. <laughs> where you're selling players for more than they're worth to your friend to get you out of trouble, and then you're buying their player for more than he's worth, and there was a lot of that going on, right? Exactly. Oh, Juvent Juventus, yeah. Juventus is still do it to this day. It's very, <laughs> it's very open and very clear. It's very, what they're doing. it's very open and very clear, but it's normal. Eh? It's normal if you don't go to a certain level. If you mm -hmm. do it in a, in a responsible way, let's say it's normal. Parma, of course, it was not. Exactly. So basically, they Parma will slowly go down between Serie A and Serie B until 2015 when they completely failed. Mm -hmm. This is the year when they when they when they failed. Mm -hmm. But before we move on, so the the Parma the Parmalat uh, bankruptcy scandal happened in 2003, and it's this is from Wikipedia. It's Europe's biggest case of bankruptcy ever, 14 billion euros. But Luca, before we move on to our second character and then to our third one, which is by far the most amazing, I wanted to ask you: Do you remember any episode in which? Uh, Tansi was interviewed besides his arrest. I remember his arrest very well, <laughs> but previous to his arrest, do you ever remember him getting on the way of the club, like talking about football, making one of those scenes that we were talking about earlier, being an actor, as you said? But uh, the, for me, the most amazing one about Tansi is that he always said he was, I uh, don't know why, but he was always saying he was uh, passionate about art. No, ah, you know, art is my favorite thing. Football is just a second. So he was always mentioning this and this and this. <laughs> when he was arrested, uh, there was this rumor that with his money he bought some uh, some very, products. Yeah, exactly. So, some very expensive paintings. <laughs> some very expensive paint, some products. But he, he always denied. Said no, no, it's not true. In the end, <laughs> we will discover. And this we, we discovered not not long time ago. Eh? Not in two thousand and three. Uh, it was just like a few years ago. We uh, basically the police discovered that in his, I think it was in the cellar or in some attics that he had, uh, he, in some properties, he had paintings of Van Gogh and Picasso for a value oh. of over, yeah, yeah, for a value of over of over uh, hundred million euro each. 
So imagine, he had, he had a private collection, basically. It was like, it was a museum. I always, I always get concerned when people go on about how much they love art. I think either they're completely bullshitting and trying to show off how, how highbrow they are, or they're criminals, is one of the two. <laughs> like... Yeah, and the, the thing, this is, Luca, you will be able to confirm or not, but I think this is also a very Italian thing. So the person who comes from a family with very little money they create the, the they they bring the family company to a new level, and at that point they have to act like they they don't mm -hmm. come from the countryside. That they have to act like they're city people, like they are into art and stuff. But if you look at pictures of Callisto Tanzi, he doesn't look like the biggest art expert in the world. So yeah, exactly. I think... <laughs> that's the, that's the amazing thing. That's the amazing thing. You know, you, you can immediately tell that he. No, his knowledge about art, but for sure it was not his main his main topic. And it was amazing that he was always showing this passion for art and whatever. In the end, he was discovered with this. Uh, it would be interesting now to know where these paintings are or what did they do with these paintings if they are in a museum or if there was an auction. I imagine. Yeah, I imagine exactly. he still owed money, right? And they were sold pretty quickly. I don't know. By the way, this was not so. The bankruptcy scandal was not the last scandal for Tansi because in 2008 he was found to have embezzled an estimated 800 million euros from the company and was jailed for fraud. So one thing that is for certain is that these paintings are not in jail with him right now. But we're nice. going to we're going to stay in the food distribution business. But we're going to move to the other coast. So right now we were on the Adriatic coast of Italy. We are going to move to Rome, where we are going to meet Sergio Cragnotti, Lazio chairman from 1992 to 1994, and then again from 1998 to 2003. Now, his most influential, influential position was, of course, as a head of the food conglomerate Cirio, and again, if you're passionate about Italian football in the 90s and early 2000s, you will remember that under his kingdom, under his spell as Lazio chairman, Lazio won the Scudetto in 2000. And if earlier we were talking about the incredible team that Parma had managed to assemble, we can only say the same thing about Lazio. Now, some of the names are the same. They are Veron, but they are again Salas, Nedved, Mihailovic, Simeone. It was a star-studded team. So, look at take... Yapstam, Yapstam as well. Yeah, Yapstam, yeah. Nesta, all these players. So, look at take us through the Sergio Cragnotti experience all the way from Rome. See, the Sergio Cragnotti experience is amazing because uh, it is, you know, we always say, you know, the U.S. is the dreamland, everything is possible. But seriously, in, in during those years, at the end of the 90s, Italy was equal, I think. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of money. It was relatively easy to, to make money or at least to, to invest. And also there were a lot of brave people that uh, like Cragnotti, that uh, that were completely into this uh, finance world because Cragnotti is uh, and when we talk about Cragnotti we talk about finance. This was his his topic. Uh, so Cragnotti, so Sergio Cragnotti, exactly Sergio or Serginho, if you want the Brazilian version, because he he lived a lot in Brazil and he made a lot of money in uh, in Brazil. So basically, uh, why what he was doing? Uh, Basically, he was um, he was uh, buying companies and sell again those companies for more money. This was what he was doing. But and of course, say, said like that, it, it, is, it looks simple, but it's not because you you need to know which company to buy at the right price and then being able you know to 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 restore in a way this company and then to sell it for a lot more money. Uh, so he was for, he, he is from Rome. He worked in finance first in Rome and, Manis, and, and then uh, for many years in, in Brazil, as said Serginho. Uh, basically, he made, uh, he was working, uh, he was not on his own. But then when he was fired, he received an, I think in English we say indemnity of, of, uh, of 80 billions of old lira. And he, he used this money to create his own company and starting a, his own his own business. He, as I said, he was buying companies in Brazil, also in Canada, mm -hmm. in Italy, a lot of this, a lot of this stuff. Um, until he reaches the top buying Cirio, which is the most important company specialized in, uh, how you say, canned food. Okay. Canned food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so again, 
when he reaches you know a certain level he sees football as another way a complementary way to make more money and uh, and he buys Lazio uh, at that time for 38 billion lira in 1992 it's a lot of money for the time but imagine that with him he wa they won one scudetto two coppa italia two italian super cup one Coppa delle Coppe, old Coppa delle Coppe, and one mm -hmm. uh, UEFA Super Cup. But the most amazing thing, and if you are a Lazio supporter, you will never forget, is that he won the Scudetto in 2000. This is like a magical uh, date on the calendar. To win the Scudetto of the Jubileo, we said in Italy, mm -hmm. this is like something you will remember forever because uh, it's not a normal one, you know. This You remember in 2000, it was like a new era, a new world yeah. coming, uh, and so to win the Scudetto in this, in this period is like uh, more than a myth, you know, it's a, it's a dream coming true. And also because they won in that, because in that period, Roma was, very, was a very good team. They were always about to win. You know, we have this thing that in Italy, Lazio and Rome, they never won that much compared no, no. To, to other teams. So if you are a Lazio supporter and you win a Scudetto in uh, Scudetto del Jubileo, as said, in 2000, and uh, with this unbelievable team, yeah, because I said, you mentioned some names, Veron, Nedved, Mancini, Nesta, Simeone, Simone Inzaghi, uh, Almeida, Marcelo Salas. Yeah. It, was, it was really, really amazing, yeah, the team. And, uh, I, 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 saw, I saw a quote earlier from an Italian businessman in the 90s who said during an interview, he said, whenever I have to sell something, I pick up my phone and I call Cragnotti and I ask him what's the correct price. He knows the price for everything. He was, so what I, I was reading articles about Cragnotti and uh, they, they were saying he was the first one who tried to merge finance and football and Lazio in the early 2000s, they were the first listed Italian team on the stock market. And... Cragnotti, again, I was finding out, he gave a recent interview in which he said that the Super League is not a new idea and he already had been talking to some Spanish presidents in La Liga in as early as 1998, 1999 to create an exclusive league of 20 teams because he said that that's the only way football is going to be viable in the future. Now, can Rory... anybody can <laughs> anybody guess which chairman he was talking to? I think it might be really hard to figure out which ones uh, he was maybe talking maybe a, to. <laughs> a certain Florentino, who knows? <laughs> but again, before so the, this again, you know how this story is going to end. So the Cragnotti family owned eighty percent of the Cirio Group, which in turn owned the fifty-one percent stake in the Roman Club of Lazio. But in 2002, the Cirio company declared a default on its bonds. And the default cost about 1.125 million euros to a plethora of Italian small investors um, from the boot. So in, um, this was kind of the end of the Cragnotti era. And again, there is also a biography, an autobiography that he published in 2006, which is called Un Calcio al Cuore, which means a kick to my heart. We can see, you know, calcio is, of course, kick, but also football. So a kick to my heart playing uh, on this a nice little pun. I can yeah. definitely imagine every single word was written by him as well. There's no ghostwriter <laughs> there. Like it was all written by him, right? He said he's at the time in jail, maybe to you know <laughs> write his own book. But um, again, Luca, before we move on to the next character, which is the big, big one, probably the funniest one. Do you have like you had for Tansi and the the whole art deal? Do you have a funny memory about Gragnotti speaking to Italian microphones? See, two things which are amazing. The first one is, uh, as you said, uh, Cragnotti was really good in uh, setting the price for everything. Also, when, he, when, there was time, when it was time to sell. And uh, it was amazing in, in 2002, basically uh, because of the, of the debt he had, he needed to use you know, the football team to, to sell everyone, basically. Mm -hmm. And there was this amazing story of uh, Nesta and Crespo having a training session at Lazio at Formello in the morning and then Cragnotti came with the phone and basically said you go there and you go there and the same day in the afternoon Nesta was presented in San Siro at AC Milan fans and Crespo was presented in San Siro on the other side of the stadium to Inter Milan fans 
and the same morning they were training together at uh, for the same team Lazio. And how did how did Lazio fans react to that? That must have been like I can imagine there was uproar the second two of their star players are sold on the drop of a hat, right? Yeah, that, that was bad, especially for Nesta because imagine that Nesta is uh, was a real Lazio supporter, you know? Well, yeah, he's from Rome, right? He's yeah. from Rome. His family supports Lazio. He always yeah, yeah, yeah. he always said that he wanted to stay there. He didn't he know like, any other. Nesta was like Totti for Roma. Like he could exactly. have become the Totti of La- wow. La- Lazio's Totti. Yeah, 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 very easily. Yeah. But, uh, but one uh, thing, sorry, Luca, one yeah. thing that I want to say, answering to Rory and then I let you go, is that these people, like the, the fans, uh, surely reacted badly to this. But the fact that they made their companies go bankrupt because they had gone out of their way to make those teams successful, mm. I think that Lazio fans will always remember, like, this person went to jail for fucking Lazio. And knowing <laughs> Lazio fans, I can well, imagine yeah, that that's, that's a source a of pride. Of honor, right? yeah. yeah, right. It's a badge of honor. Like, he's been to jail. So I think that you have to understand that they, di- like, they went out of their way. They gave away their freedom sometimes. For the football club, they were real supporters. It and sounds almost honorable when you put it like that, Tommy, even no, though it's all just fraud. No, it is fraud. <laughs> but for example, I was reading about an article about Cagnotti and Sven Goran Eriksson. He said that he was the most present owner he's ever had at any football club. He said that every training session, he would go there, he would ask him about the team, and then he would tell him, Look, we have to sell somebody. Who could it be? They would talk football every single day. And then, of course, he would embezzle his funds and all of that. But well, I think Sven <laughs> fucking loves a pound note. So I think anyone who pays him, <laughs> Sven's quite happy with. But yeah, he's also worked for quite a few mental chairmen. So maybe he is the authority on it. I don't know. But sorry, Luca, you were saying before we move on to our last big name. See, the last thing about Cragnotti, which for me is really amazing, uh, because it's something that, um, for me, he was right. So there is this thing, uh, in, in, uh, in English we can translate it with, like, never change a winning one, you know? Squadra che vince non si cambia. Okay, yeah, yeah. This yeah, is what we, yeah. we say everywhere, and not only in Italy. Um, he was saying exactly the opposite. Squadra che vince si cambia. So that's, mm. that's amazing because he was convinced, and I am convinced too, that when you when you reach the top, when you win everything, for example, a Scudetto, for, yeah, a, for a team yeah. like Lazio, then you have to sell everything. I completely agree with this because when you reach the top, when you have the maximum, you know, uh, you can have, there's no sense to continue with the same uh, with the same line because all the motivations are gone. So that's why some uh, some very sly coaches you know like Mourinho when they won then they then they left and he did good for my, we have plenty of examples like for example Inter after the play they, they could sell everyone everyone at the market they sell they sold no one and we they say these, these people that for 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 some years you know I don't want to say that they ruined what they did before but in a way you know they they didn't live like like a, like a legend you know and Cragnotti was completely convinced of, uh, of this. When you reach the, the peak, when you want a trophy, sell whatever you can. And with the money, you change, you innovate, you buy, you buy new people. We have Let's say that if, if Cragnotti had been president of Manchester United, maybe Sir Alex Ferguson would have lasted only two seasons. So. <laughs> well, yeah, quite Manchester United fans can rejoice there. This was our second one. Luca, we have 10 more minutes to talk about the big one. They used to call him the Volcano. This one deserves an episode of his own. So before I say the name, he was the president and owner of Perugia Calcio from 1991 to 1993, and then again from 1996 to 2004. Again, the uh, the Parmalat bankruptcy scandal was in 2004. The Cirio one was in 2002. You, you will see about Perugia Calcio in 2004. Let's say that Italian authorities really went hunting down these people in the early 2000s. But he was also the president of Viterbese Calcio, San Benedettese Calcio, and Calcio Catania. But he was also very passionate about horse riding. He bought a horse for 12 million lire back in the day and was able to sell it for more than a billion. This horse ended up winning the most prestigious race there is in France. This man eventually died in Santo Domingo 
last year, we are talking about the Volcano, the Hurricane, Luciano, Gaucci. And I know that Luca here really could go on for one hour about Luciano Gaucci. So tell us a little bit about this figure who started working as a bus driver in Rome. He created a cleaning company and then it just went up, up. He became Roma's vice president in 1984. However, there are rumors that the president on his dying bed told one of his counselors, please don't leave Roma to Luciano Gaucci. He was kind of afraid <laughs> of what he had created. So Luca, please tell us a little bit more about him. See, Luciano Gaucci. Luciano Gaucci, uh, I invite everyone to just type uh, his name on Google and see the face and you will immediately know <laughs> why, why we love him so much. Already from the face, you can see that it's like, you know, these movies when they represent Al Capone or this boss uh, in Chicago and in the U.S. during that period. He is like this. Uh, so legend, legend. Already from the face, you could already say, tell that uh, he was not a normal one. And the amazing thing exactly that he started as a bus driver. He was, uh, he was driving buses in Rome. So he was, uh, he was an employee. Mm -hmm. not, not even the best uh, job in the world. Uh, but he was, Gauchi did everything in his life. This is really amazing. So he started his own business, exactly, as, as Tommy said, a small cleaning uh, company. Um, so imagine at the beginning, he had like uh, 100 workers. And uh, in, in few years, he had over uh, 300,000 workers. And they started to, to clean everywhere, not only in Rome, but in every region of, of Italy. So this, this company was, was huge. And, uh, but the amazing thing exactly is that it was, uh, his, his real passion was for horse racing. And, uh, but already from his experience in, in horse racing, you can see where he was good. So it was, uh, basically the thing for Gaucci is that he had, he had no fear to, to bet, you know, like he was betting mm -hmm. for a horse, same he was doing in football. He was betting for players, you know, he didn't care if he was too young or not prepared or whatever. He was just like playing. I decide it's your time play. And this was amazing because he, he launched several several amazing football players and he also did some other, you know, more or less strange things that we will... Uh, what we'll is see. this? Is this the guy who... So he, it was Perugia, right, that he was in charge of? Mm -hmm. See. Did he sign Gaddafi's son? Is that that time? That's exactly. It. Exactly. Yeah, that's, him. Okay. that's him. That's the first amazing thing because he liked to shock, you know, to provoke. So imagine he signed Saadi Gaddafi, <laughs> the son of the of the Libyan politician. Uh, so imagine because at that time, you know, Gaddafi at that time uh, was of course super important. But you know, Libya and Italy they were very they were friends. Let's say yeah, 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 in, yeah. That, in that period, you know, without going too much into politician. But <laughs> yeah. Gaddafi was uh, was really present in Italy. So imagine mm -hmm. signing the son of uh, of a dictator. Basically, uh, <laughs> it was a, I don't know even how to describe. It was a just you know it was a, it, it is a marketing thing. It's genius marketing thing. You know, it's, right. it's something uh, unbelievable. Uh, well, it's a story that reached England. If you know what I mean, like all of a sudden people yeah, in England knew see, who Perugia were because they signed Gaddafi's son, right? Same. That's how I learned about them. I didn't know who they were before that. Like, But that, I mean, that wasn't even that wasn't even the biggest shock because in exactly. 2021, this will sound crazy, but Luciano Gaucci was the first person who proposed to have women in football and he appointed a woman head coach for Perugia and then he even purchased the female player and asked the, the Italian Football League to review the rules because starting the next season, he wanted to start that woman in his starting 11. Weirdly progressive. Right? Amazing, yeah? Eh? <laughs> right. Amazing. Yeah. You, you will never associate this to, to, a person, uh, to a person like Luciano Gaucci. Imagine you see the picture of Luciano Gaucci and you listen to this story. You will never tell that this man mm. did this. But yeah, that's true. That's amazing. That's the second uh, amazing part of Luciano. Because basically, yeah, during those magical years, he was also, I said, the owner of this another club, Viterbese, which uh, was in uh, third division. And uh, basically, he chose as a, as, a man, as a coach, Carolina Morace. Carolina Morace, just for those who don't know, is one of, the, of our best uh, women in football we ever had mm -hmm. in, uh, in Italian football. And uh, so, yeah, the shock, imagine, the shock for this, for this decision was, was huge because never before a woman was called to coach 
a club in Italy in third division. Imagine the ignorance mm. of training a coach yeah. in third <laughs> division, Central Italy, and to be a woman doing doing this. And exactly the second, uh, he tried again with the German champion Prince, the lady. The, the, okay. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, she was amazing. Yeah, uh, and he he signed he signed Prince for Perugia for Serie A, magic, and. Uh, <laughs> He, he organized a press conference where he said, there's no problem. She will have her own changing room. No problem. I will fix everything. And then everything was done. You know, the contract was done. The, the salary was done. And everything was... Uh, finally, FIFA uh, will deny the, the transfer, you know. So we, it was it was denied by FIFA because it was uh, it was even difficult to, to deal with a situation like this. Imagine uh, a Serie A team buying uh, a, a, a woman, a champion, uh, to play for Serie A. So all, this also gives you the idea of how Serie A in those years was really a magical land. Everything was was possible, you know? It feels, it kind of, it always gave off the vibe of like the Wild West, if you know what I mean? Like people just kind of <laughs> tried to see what laws they had to follow, which ones they could break, how they could get around it. But I feel like that might be very Italian in general. But in the 90s and 2000s, it, it looked like the Wild West, definitely. But again, and it wasn't, uh, he was one of the first uh, presidents to bring to Europe Asian players. And one of them was Mr. Hidetoshi Nakata, which you will definitely remember, but also <laughs> the Korean Han. And this See? one's an incredible story. We are <laughs> going to cover with Luca the disappointment for Italy at the World Cup 2002 in another episode. But Han is one of the players that scored against Italy. And eventually that result resulted in Italy leaving the World Cup. It was a huge scandal. And Luciano Gaucci went off on national television. He said, si, this, si, man, this man doesn't deserve anything. I took him from <laughs> nowhere. I brought him to Italy. I gave him money. I acted like a father towards him. And when he scores against Italy, he starts celebrating like there's no tomorrow. The second he comes back to Italy, I'm going to just tear apart his contract and he's gone. And he did. <laughs> this is not even the best story. <laughs> There is, I mean, this one, unfortunately, you can't find with the subtitles. But, Luca, can you quickly tell our listeners about the incident with Matarrese after the infamous Perugia-Bari game? See, basically, uh, the, the, the problem with Matarrese, Matarrese is another person that we could talk about eh, because it was, another, it was another myth. And there was this game, exactly, Perugia-Bari. Basically... Uh, it was a normal moment during the game. You know, there was this uh, Perugia player uh, falling down because uh, apparently injured. Well, not apparently, because in the end we, we discovered that he, that he was injured. And uh, and basically, you know, uh, the, there is always this situation that the game wasn't stopped. Uh, uh, the other players continue to play and whatever. Uh, they eventually scored. And basically, at the end of the game, uh, in the really fresh uh, in the in the parking of uh, in the parking of the stadium, we have this fight between Gaucci and Matarese because Bau Gau uh, Matarese basically was uh, was crying of joy, and saying, uh, "Gaucci, we deserve Serie A with your team. You can go to to third division again." And Gaucci, you know, like a, like a good father, was like, "Ah, bastard." My player was uh, was injured, was down on the field, and you continue to play. And they 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 fought. They had a fight, basically. There is this video you can find it in YouTube. There is this fight at the at the entrance of the <laughs> Gauchi <laughs> trying to fight <laughs> from the a, bus, a, going down from the bus. A big people man. Like, Ga Gauchi is like a fat guy. He's not big. He's a fat guy, right? He was not yeah, in shape. Huge. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. absolutely not in shape. But in that video, you could see, and he was always, you know, very elegant. Uh, <laughs> very so imagine, and it was and it was and it was raining outside. So imagine these two people fighting under the rain. <laughs> no, but man, it's it's <laughs> literally it's literally what you tell your kids. Like you don't want to become like that, like a grown yes. man. And at a point, like I think it's Matarese going back to the bus. 
And the Matarez is a piece of shit as well. Like he's back in the bus. They're telling him, calm down, go in the bus. They're like, Matarese, stop, stop. Gaucci turns around. And then Matarese, like a schoolboy, comes out of the bus and he's like, you're an idiot. And at that point, <laughs> Gaucci just goes back. He's like, don't you fucking say that again. I'm not an idiot. You're a piece of shit. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But that's one of the most incredible pages of Italian football. That's <laughs> most, that, that was one of the most amazing. Also, because these people, you know, when then they were asked by the press, oh, what happened again? They, they completely... They they never said sorry, you know. Especially Gauchi was like, I don't give a shit. Do whatever you want. Send me send me home. But uh, if I if I see him again, I will knock him down. You know things like this in uh, in TV. But uh, as, as Tommy said, the thing uh, I would like to, to talk just about uh, one second. My memory about uh, An, the the Korean uh, the mm -hmm. Korean player. Imagine An scored the golden goal against Italy. So it was him that basically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kicked out uh, Italy. And again, as I said, he was, uh, he was playing in Perugia, for Perugia, and it was amazing because Gaucci, he was really fast, he was really like, you know, cool to immediately organize a press conference. And as Tommy said, in front of all Italy saying like, you know, this is the contract, he destroyed the contract, he said like, you can go home, uh, I gave you, I gave you food, you know, you were no one, and now <laughs> you did this. So imagine if you, if you see this, as you said, you know, uh, Wild West, if you see this, I think there's no one who didn't like in Italy at that moment, you know, being kicked out from uh, South Korea in the World Cup. There's no one who didn't love Gaucci in that uh, <laughs> so in, in that moment, so, how can so you in, how can you not love Gauchi if he does if someone like him does uh, something? I'm like trying that. to think if that happened in England, how it would go down. <laughs> Probably more popularly than I think. But so in in general, in Italy, are these chairmen like are they kind of laughing stocks? Like, is it now like people just joke about them and they're seen as funny figures, or are they still seen as like successful businessmen who were just a bit eccentric? Well, can I say one thing? Gaucci, we didn't finish the story, but Gaucci in the end, he was the least successful of the three presidents that we've mentioned. So, however, uh, Perugia went to a Coppa Italia semifinal and they did also participate in the UEFA Cup, with, for, mm -hmm. which for the city of Perugia was huge. Um, in 2000, uh, I think in 2004, um, they declared the, the Perugia bankrupt. And uh, Gaucci escaped, uh, escaped the process, the, the trial in court. He escaped and he went to Santo Domingo, where he then died. Like he was, he extradited himself to, to Santo Domingo. But I'm. Um, That's a pretty baller move, I'll be honest. That's a so pretty that, baller move. Yeah, I, I let Luca go, but I think that besides Gaucci, Gaucci is a bit of the laughing stock. Like you remember Gaucci of his, because of his press conferences and trying to beat up Matarese. But I think See? that. Uh, I think See? that. Uh, I, I think that of the three we've talked about, I think that Cragnotti is the one who is widely recognized as the most capable manager of uh, businessman of the three. See, I don't know no what doubt. Luca. Luca no, no doubt, about, no doubt. I completely agree. Gaucci was, let's say, less successful. Even if I said, remember, for a for a city like Perugia, uh, third division, uh, having a president like this, you know, you go to Serie A, you go to. Europa League, it was huge. Also, if you see some names that played in Perugia at the time, we have Materazzi, Gattuso, even Grosso, you know? Oddo, Oddo, uh, Oddo and Grosso as well. Yeah, Miccoli, Nakata, and then some uh, Allegri was playing there. We had Cosmi, because Cosmi is a legend in the, mm. in the, in the field of, of coaches in Italy. He was, uh, he was the coach of this, uh, of this amazing team. So, um, Gaucci, of course, as said, he liked to, to shock you know, to buy players from, I don't know, Venezuela, Korea, or uh, the, from, uh, from Libya. He was not even a player, but uh, so he liked to do this, yeah, to, 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 to be provocative, you know. <laughs> but uh, again, the, and, uh, as Tommy said, basically, uh, he was, um, he, Gaucci was investigated uh, and convicted for uh, bankrupt, you know, fraudulent bankrupt. And basically, he, he escaped, but like, like, a, like a fugitive. You know, he was uh, not like, uh, not just because he, he has nothing to do. He escaped like a fugitive to Santo Domingo and never came back because basically in Santo Domingo, he was, he couldn't be, he couldn't be taken, you know, to yeah. back to Italy yeah. for to court. So he just lived there. He created another family there, he married another lady there. So he, he, has, he has a family there. And this when he was already 60, 60 something, huh? 66 or, or something like that. 
And uh, and the amazing thing is that he was so he was like a little kid until the end. You know, he was like ah, Italy. I did all these things to Italy, to Italian you know business and Italian football, and they they sent me to you know to court. So in the end, he he was so let's say like offended. You know, like a little mm-hmm. kid that when he died, he he asked to to stay in Santo Domingo. He's there. He's in a graveyard there. It's oh wow! Right. There. You know, so he he never never came came back. He didn't and forgive. He, he didn't forgive exactly. Italy for doing its he, job. He never, exactly, yeah, never he's, forgive. He sounds and completely even, sociopathic. Exactly. <laughs> completely sociopathic. Imagine, imagine his Italian family, the son and whatever, yeah, that yeah, had, yeah. To, had to accept the fact that he left. He stayed. He said, "Bye, fuck you all. I stay here in Santo Domingo. <laughs> I never come back. And even when I die, I want to be uh, buried here in uh, in the island." Wow. That's, I think this is the best end to, to our Guys, we've gone a little bit over time, but I just want to tell classic. classic. But this topic was too great, and Gaucci deserves an episode of his own. I just want to say two <laughs> more things about Gaucci. He ended up marrying his first wife, who was his son's girlfriend. I repeat it. His first <laughs> wife was his son's girlfriend. So imagine you bring your girlfriend home, you introduce her to your dad. Next thing you know, he's going to marry her. So that's one thing. And the second thing, I sent you guys the picture on the WhatsApp group. He used to live in a legit Renaissance castle in central Italy. So <laughs> this, this was the character. And by the way, Rory, yeah, you understood when, when Luke and I talk about these people and we say he was a myth, let's say that there is one letter in common with the word mafioso. So many times when there is somebody <laughs> who is so outspokenly, like, you know, just unique to us, he's a myth of Italian football. But Luca, our time has run up. I hope you enjoyed the episode. We've already drawn up a list of other weekly topics to talk about. I'm very excited. We're going to cover Berlusconi's AC Milan, the Moratti's winning Champions League from father to son, and much, much more. Luca, anything more to add about crazy Italian presidents? Uh, no, nothing else. I hope uh, our listeners enjoyed, and uh, uh, I hope they will, uh, let's say, investigate more about these people because there is a lot mm-hmm. to to learn about them. Not only from you know the 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 bullshit part, the joking part, and all the crazy stuff they did, but because just to to know that. Uh, um, Italy in that period was really like a, a place where you could uh, you could mm, have a big business and make um, mm. make a lot of money. So that's uh, that's that's really interesting, you know, because we we miss we all miss this uh, this period. Yeah, and I I think sometimes I look I don't know sometimes I wish I was the age that I am now in the 1990s because I would have oh, seen mate, I, I wish that on a, a daily basis I wish I'd been this age in the 90s. There was so much money going around and everything seemed possible, but we were only kids buying Parmalat snacks at the supermarket. <laughs> Rory, did you enjoy this episode from an English standpoint? Mate, I loved it. I loved it. Like I said, we don't really have like crazy chairman, not in the same. Style. Style. Maybe we can, me and AFC Finners can do an English one and do the the English version of Crazy Chairman. But yeah, just just Gauchi's name and face makes me laugh. So just hearing about him is great. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you very much, Luca, for coming on. Thank you, Rory, for being my co-host. As You're always. welcome. And we're going to jump to the one minute to kick off quiz. Mate, Tommy, I don't know about you, but I really, really enjoyed that chat. Gauchi, what a character, man. Yeah, no, Gauchi really deserves an episode of its own. He's an incredible character. Um, We had to pick these three presidents. We wanted to talk also about Moratti and Berlusconi, but then we thought we're going to dedicate them um, another episode. We could do an episode about current crazy chairman because we still have our fair share. But yeah, Gaucci is uh, a league of his own, really. Um, Caragnotti, you you got it. Caragnotti was like the businessman. Tanzi was like the businessman with way less insight than the other two. And Gaucci was just like the flamboyant president who just always had to, you know, make a press conference. That's a very Italian thing. Even Totti, you remember the the press conference? Like when you want to say something, you just call up a press conference, invite a bunch of journalists and just like spit your mind out. (laughs) 
Yeah, it does. It is very Italian. It is very Italian. I think. Um, I think my favourite Gauchi story was the signing Gaddafi's son. I think that is like I remember as a teenager just being kind of when that reading it in like world football or something and just being like, what the hell is going on there? Like, that's definitely one of my favourite stories. What a showcase for our country, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. But it's finally time for our quiz, Rory. And you didn't tell our listeners last week what would be your topic this week. What it's going to be. I know it's very unlike us to forget to do something or to not include something, but um, my topic is going to be taking inspiration from you. I have chosen England from 2000 to 2021. Very nice. So, Rory, I've got seven questions for you here. Our game for the new listeners consists on one of the two asking the other person seven questions on a chosen topic within a minute of time. Whoever answers to more gets more points. Rory is currently leading nine to four. Yup, I have a bunch of stinkers. I think it's time for our theme sound. Okay, Mr. Rory Criscolo, you're going to be tested on the England national football team from 2000 to 2021. Are you ready? Let's do it. Ready, set, go. 2000 to 2021, how many non-English managers for the English national team? Two. Correct. Besides Allardyce, who had a 100% win percentage, who, who who had the best managerial record? Hodgson? Wrong. Yeah. 2002 World Cup. England finished second in Group F. Who topped it on goals scored? Argentina. Wrong. 2004 European Championship. Zidane scores a brace on stoppage time to seal a 2-1 comeback. Who had scored for England? Beckham. Wrong. 2004 oh. European Championship quarterfinals. Aside from Beckham, who missed the, the second penalty for England? Lampard? Oh, I'm doing Wrong. Damn it. 2008 European Championship. England didn't qualify, didn't qualify for this final stage of the tournament. Can you name one of the two teams who ranked above them in Group E? Sweden. Wrong. Uh. Who is the youngest debutant ever for England? He debuted between 2000 and 2021. Theo Walcott. Correct. (laughs) Rory, you've got two. Awful. This is the worst you've done so far, which means that you're now leading 11 to 4. I will have a chance next week with my chosen topic, which I'll reveal soon. But first, the correct answers. It was correct, Rory. Two non-English managers. What are their names? Fabio Capello and Sven, of course. Sven Goran Eriksson, correct. So Allardyce played and managed England only for one game, and he ended up <laughs> winning it. But this, so he's got a one hundred percent win rate. But the second best win percentage is from the Italian Fabio Capello, really six point seven percent, forty two games played, twenty eight won, eight drawn. And six lost. I don't know why I said Hodgson. I panicked there, I think. <laughs> in 2002, England, England finished the second in Group F of the World Cup, and Sweden topped it on <sighs> goals scored. I was trying to remember who I, I could remember who was in the group. The group was Sweden, England, Nigeria, and Argentina. I just couldn't remember who was there. Yeah. Correct. Damn. Correct. The group of death in 2002. That's what they called it. 2004 European Championship, Zidane scored a brace on stoppage time to seal a 2-1 comeback. Frank Lampard had scored the first goal at the 38th minute. In the 2004 European Championship quarterfinals, Beckham missed his penalty, which was the first one. And De- Darius Vassell. Vassell. Darius Vassell. Vassell. Never Damn. heard this name ever in my life. <laughs> uh, it was Darius Vassell, correct? And then the 2008 European Championship. England didn't qualify. I didn't remember this. Yeah. Could you, you couldn't name any of the two teams who ranked Croatia above them. Croatia was one of them, right? Yup. Croatia and Russia. And who is the youngest debutant for England ever? It's Theo Walcott. Do you remember how old he was? 
17? He was 17 years old and 75 days on May 30th, 2006. Funny thing, he hadn't even debuted in the Premier League. Yeah, 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 yeah. He'd only played in the Championship at that point, I think, uh, for Southampton. He'd just been transferred to Arsenal. And the future was bright and hopeful for Theo. Oh, our hopes were high. Our hopes uh, were so high. Very, very high. I remember I was quite excited about Theo Walcott as well. So right now I have to, cho- to choose my chosen topic for next week. And I think it's going to be Juventus. Just like the history Juventus. of Juventus. Yeah. Just Juventus. It, okay, it's going to be right. Juventus. Yeah. I Open feel like questions. It, Good. I like it. It's one of Italy's biggest clubs, and I feel like, you know, we should give them some credit. And, um, yeah, I've, I already know a few of the answers. How many Champions League finals have they lost? Seven. <laughs> Let's go. Oh, Next no. one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to change the question. Damn it. But that's it from me, listeners. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Anglo Italian Pod, on Twitter at Italian Anglo Pod. Starting from this very Monday, we're going to be live again on Twitch and YouTube. Check our stories, check our Twitter. We will let you know exactly at what time we will be on to discuss everything and anything related to national leagues, but especially the champions because ladies and gentlemen the champions league is back next week Uh, that's uh, all from uh, me uh. exactly that's all from me rory i'm gonna leave it to you to send our uh, listeners off with our customary quote and for the first time this quote is a reported quote so i hope it's true in the scuffle that broke out between England and Poland, Kamil Glick reportedly turned around to Harry Maguire and said, they paid 80 million for you. They must be fucking mad. Well, at least our podcast is free. Thank you, listeners. We will see you next week. Bye.